welcome to the Blindfold Chess Podcast. Born to a family of economists in 1996, Hungarian native Richard Rapport got into chess when his father was concerned about his lack of concentration in primary school. Shortly after an introduction to the game, Richard was hooked so much that his father became concerned that he was concentrating too much on chess. Rather than pulling him away, his parents embraced the enthusiasm by coordinating extended leaves from school to travel and play in tournaments. Quite quickly, Richard's success snowballed. At age 11, he became a FIDE master. He earned his international master title the next year. He picked up his three grandmaster norms in three consecutive tournaments. Then he earned his grandmaster title at the age of 13 years and 11 months, making him the youngest Hungarian grandmaster at the time to do so, and the fifth youngest to do so. After acquiring the grandmaster title, Rapport has only continued to grow. In 2016, at the age of 20, he was the highest rated under-21 player in the world with a 27-17 rating, solidifying that by playing and winning a match against the number two junior in the world, Wei Yi, with a rating of 27.07. In 2017, he played in the Tata Steel Tournament, where he faced Magnus Carlsen for the first time and beat him in 33 moves. Later that year, he won the Hungarian Chess Championship. In 2022, he qualified for the Candidates Tournament by placing second in the 2022 Grand Prix event. He didn't perform well in the Candidates, but he did act as challenger Ding Lorenz second during the 2023 World Championship, where Ding later defeated Jan Napomniachi. The accolades and accomplishments are not why I enjoy Rapport. He has a unique and creative playing style. He is known for his unorthodox openings and his ability to create complex and unpredictable positions on the board, sometimes even at the detriment of his own position, just to exhibit some interesting ideas. There are jokes that go around that Rapport looks to leave book slash theory as soon as possible to just play chess, and that is amazing to watch at such a high level. It is a rather high level of risk to play in that way at such a high level. This week, we are traveling to St. Louis during the 2019 Champions Showdown. Richard Rapport versus Samuel Shanklin. Now, if we're ready, let's begin. 1. Pawn to d4. Pawn to d5. 2. Knight c3. Knight f6. 3. Bishop g5. Knight b to d7. 4. Pawn to e3. Pawn to c6. Five, knight f3. Pawn to e6. Six, bishop d3. Bishop e7. Seven, kingside castle. Kingside castle. 8. Pawn to h3. The move h3 by white is a bit peculiar. What do you think some of the ideas behind it are? One option could be to prevent any black pieces from landing on the g4 square, but that doesn't seem likely in the near future. Another alternative could be to allow the dark square bishop to have retreat squares in case black decides to play h6 or g5 or e5. The bishop can go from g5 to f4 back to h2. Pawn to 
Pawn to c5. Nine, pawn to a3. Pawn to a6. Ten, knight e5. Pawn to h6. Eleven, bishop f4. Knight captures e5. White has two ways he can capture back on e5, with the pawn on d4 and with the bishop on f4. Which one would you do and why? Twelve, pawn d captures e5. In this case, even though it does double white's pawns, capturing the knight on e5 with the pawn makes more sense, as it forces black's remaining knight on f6 to move, which weakens the black king side. Knight d7. Thirteen. Queen g4. Pawn to f5. Fourteen. Queen g6. Rook f7. Fifteen. Queen captures e6. Knight f6. With the move knight to f6, black now has a discovered attack with which piece? That would be the light squared bishop on c8 is attacking the white queen on e6. Where would you move the queen in this situation? Sixteen, bishop captures f5. That was kind of a trick question because the white queen is currently trapped. So now as white, you have to justify losing your queen. Can you see what white's plan is here? Bishop captures e6. Seventeen, bishop captures e6. Knight e8. Eighteen, knight captures d5. Knight c7. Nineteen, Knight captures c7. Rook b8. Black's queen is able to capture the white knight on c7. Why do you think black didn't capture the free knight? The move fails tactically because after queen captures c7, then white will play bishop on e6, captures on f7, check, the king will capture on f7, then white can play e6, check, which puts the king in check and has a discovered attack on the queen with the bishop on f4 attacking the black queen on c7. 20. Bishop captures f7 check. King captures f7. Twenty-one. 
rook a to d1. Queen f8. Twenty two, Rook D seven. Rook D eight. Twenty three, Rook F to D one. Rook captures D seven. Twenty four. Pawn to e6 check. Black resigns. Black resigned here as the pawn will capture on d7, leaving white with a very dangerous pawn as well as being ahead on material. I like this game as white is attacking on the king side. White goes for a bit of a dubious trap with queen to g6, but manages to trick Shanklin by playing queen captures e6, sacrificing his queen, getting compensation out of it, and then eventually winning the game out of it. It is ideas like that, and he has several games with the Nimso Larson where he's playing g4 and h4, or using the bishop on b2 to capture a knight on f6, and it's just a lot of very unique ideas that he comes up with. So that is all that we have for this week. Tune in next time where we will continue to work on our blindfold skills and look at another game of the Masters. <laughs>